all for braving the cold and some of you uh, some uh, pretty bad road conditions. When I was a kid, we grew up on the gravel and our road was shut uh, by the snow quite easily. So thank you. Thank you to our, you know, our county plows and state plows. Amen? Okay, let's remember to pray for them uh, while they're out and about. Some of them are, you know, take, helping us get where we need to go. We're grateful for them. You know, today we, we, is a Sunday, and we gather together every Sunday with two purposes in mind. We praise God for all of who He is, and we thank Him for all that He has done. We do that with song, we do it in prayer, and then we give our hearts and minds attention to His Word today as well. And that's our aim and intention. The Scriptures say this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Amen? It also says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You might not like the snow, but friends, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we have the opportunity to rejoice in all the salvation that He has won and purchased for us. I want to give a special welcome to all of you who are newcomers, you brave the cold, or some of you are guests with us this morning. We're really glad that you are here, and of course, welcome to all of you who are a regular part of First Reformed Church. Welcome, welcome. Why don't you stand and uh, find a neighbor, maybe someone behind you, maybe it's somebody new that you've not met before. Maybe they go to first service and you're hardly acquainted with one another. But welcome everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship you, 
good. pray with me. And God, we want to say thank you that you have made us your children. You have adopted us into your family. The moment you moved upon our hearts to put our faith, our trust in you, and you put your spirit in us, Lord, and you adopted us into the family that we can say we are children of the living God. and We belong to you for good and forever. Thank you, Lord, for that great promise. And let our hearts thus rest secure in that truth, we pray. We love you, Jesus, and bless you today. In your great name we pray. Amen. Friends, please be seated. And there's a few things I want to make sure that you know about that are coming up in the next uh, week or so. Uh, first of all, I want to draw your attention to that connection card that's inside of your worship uh, program. This is your opportunity if you're new with us. Uh, thank you for braving the winter weather. Uh, but we'd love to know who you are. We'd love to know your name. We'd love to get in contact with you. And so please fill that out. There's a gift waiting for you when you bring that to the welcome table, the glass doors in the back. A team member there will take that and give you a little gift to say thank you for being with us. Uh, on the back side, you can request prayer or sign up for some opportunities. That's for everybody to be involved. And I get a few of these. And I thank you for those of you who are, some of you are regular contributors to my prayer life. For all of you, I appreciate that. And any time you or somebody you know needs prayer, you can write it here or just give me a call. I really, uh, really, uh, how do I say it? really want you to do that, and I love being able to take those things before the Lord. So please, please, please make use of that. All right, here's a couple of opportunities that we have coming up that uh, we can be uh, more like missionaries in our own community. On January 21, uh, our outreach team is putting on um, uh, an event 
to uh, feed the linemen, the power linemen uh, students at NCC. Uh, we're going to feed them some chili. So I think we've got plenty of chili makers, but what we really need on January 21 is a lot of guys. Guys who are just going to sit, eat some chili with the guys, and build relationships and start conversations. You know, it's an opportunity for us as a church to demonstrate the love of Jesus in a practical way, but we need to help make that connection between serving the food and the, you know, and the connection to Jesus. And so that would be your part. Uh, we need guys, and if you would, please just sign up in the back. Some people have already done that, but this is your opportunity to be a little part of the mission work that God is calling us to do. Uh, coming up in February, uh, Rob wants us to know about the event, the marriage event that's happening at, uh, called uh, Living Room Reset, and that's a February 28th. If you'd like tickets for that, they're sold out online, but we still have tickets here in the church office if you would like to grab some of those as well. Of course, another way that we can participate in God's kingdom work to put our giving behind our pro-life believing is to give to the Cherish House. That fundraiser is going on. If you haven't picked up a little bottle in the back, a little baby bottle, you can do that. Your task is to fill that with as much coins as you possibly can. And if you don't have any coins, a lot of people just say, forget about it. I'll just stuff some bills in there or write out a check. And that's great, too. Uh, well, it's a fundraiser we do to help put our pro-life uh, believing into action. So please take note of those things. And there's a lot more in uh, your worship bulletin. Please take note of those things as well. Okay, here's what we've got to pray for. Uh, we've got, I got a few people we need to bring before the king. Uh, first of all, we need to pray for Ivan Pennings. Ivan's up in Rochester, and this isn't his first you know, rodeo at, Ro at Rochester. In fact, this isn't his first rodeo in the hospital at all. Uh, it's been a significant part of his life. But he's in a precarious spot, real tough spot right now in ICU. We need to pray for him. And so Jan, his wife, would like us to pray, and so would Ivan. So let's lift him up before the Lord. Today, uh, we get to rejoice as well. Uh, Charlie and Nicole Dipp had a baby girl. Her name is Lena Ray. Isn't that awesome? That is so awesome. And so we get to rejoice with them uh, and rejoice too with Mark and Melinda, Grandma and Grandpa, and Dave and Carol Van Beek, or Great Grandma and Great Grandpa. I mean, it's an amazing thing uh, that we live, could be able to live long enough to not only see our grandkids, but great grandkids, and some of us blessed with great great grandkids. And so we rejoice with that family too. While at the same time, we also uh, sorrow uh, with uh, Bernice Mao's family. Uh, Bernice died a week ago today in, uh, in the late evening last Sunday. So let's pray for Tom and Jill, for Teresa and Stephen. Uh, Tom's her son, Teresa, her daughter, uh, her granddaughter, but also Herb and Lori Strike. Uh, Herb is Bernice's brother and Elaine Coles, her sister too. So let's pray for them in their moment of grief as well. Services for Bernice will be on the 31st at the end of the month. But then also Jim Remersmith told me this morning that he would like you to pray for him in this coming week. On Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the morning, he's going to be having surgery for his leg to correct some of the, hopefully correct some of the troubles he's had for quite a while. And this is a, a really important one that has, if it doesn't go well, we have some um, unhappy consequences at the end. We don't need to go into that, but Jim would like for us to pray. So with those things in mind, and we've got a few people on our prayer list that's inside of our bulletin, let's go to the king and bring them before him. Please pray with me. And God, we bless you that you are the king of kings. And just as we would come before our mom or our dad and ask, Lord, for things that we need, you have welcomed us as your, ch your children and have invited us to come and bring before you our needs, our concerns, and, Lord, those of others as well. And so we come, Lord, together as a church family, as a gathering of worshipers, and bring before you. And we praise you that you are the one who has all power in your hands to do what we might think is the impossible, but yet you can pull it off to much praise and honor and glory to you. And we praise you that even though now sometimes we don't see the prayers for which we have asked and, and uh, sought your face about, we don't see it come in our time. We know that one day, Jesus, you are making all things new. And we long for that day and pray for its coming. God, be gracious and so kind. Today we pray to uh, Ivan in his precarious and tough spot at the hospital. Lord, he's been here before. He'd say by his own words, it's been five times already that he should have died, but you have brought him through. And he finds himself in that tough spot again, Jesus. And we pray that you would stretch out your hand and do what you do best and deliver him. And we pray for Jan, Lord, who, who stands by here at home wanting to be in Rochester, not wanting him to be alone or by himself. We pray that you would also give to her your peace, 
your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we lift them up before you today. Bring your healing to, to Ivan. And God, we bless you for the new little one that you have given to Charlie and Nicole. Uh, thank you for little Lena Ray and for her safe delivery into the, into the world and, and to bring for Charlie and Nicole to bring her home. God, we just bless you and thank you. You here now have given to them a new child, to Mark and Melinda a grandchild, and to Dave and Carol a great, great, or a great grandchild. God, these things come from your hands, these blessings. And so may your favor uh, come upon Charlie and Nicole, Lord, as they learn how to be parents. Give them great wisdom to help little Lena, Lord, to know you, love you, serve you, and follow you. And God, give uh, wisdom and help, Lord, to Mark and Melinda as they stand by, and Charlie's parents, too, to help, support, and encourage along the way. God, thank you for this little child. We bless you. Lord, we pray for um, Tom and Jill and Teresa and Stephen and Herb and Lori and Elaine today as this whole family is grieving uh, Bernice's death. God, walk with them. Comfort them. Give them great peace. Lord, as they hurt, as they sorrow, Lord, you, you say in your word, that uh, you have comforted us so that we can comfort others. Help us, the church family, Lord, who have walked this same road, to now to walk with them and be part of your comfort for this family. Lord, we lift them up to you today and wipe away their tears and cause them to hold on to the hope that is found in your Son and in him alone, we pray. We lift up Lord Jim today and pray for his surgery coming up Wednesday and ask that, Lord, it would be successful. And that there wouldn't be any fear of what comes beyond this day. And so we lift him up and we pray that you would deliver. Thank you for the doctors, Lord, to whom you have given great wisdom and great skill. It all comes from your hand. And Lord, we pray that they, all the training and all the wisdom that they have accumulated might come to moment and bear upon that surgery for Jim. And for success, we pray. We lift him up. We lift up, Lord, Alice to you, our sister, as she's been released and here back in Sheldon at the hospital. We pray for her continued recovery and strength for her. Lord, for Bob, we pray that you would stretch out your hand. And as we've prayed in the past, that we would continue to pray for him, that you would deliver him from the cancer. But also we pray for his wife, Norma, that, Lord, you would give her, gear her up with great strength to attend to his needs and help him to recover. And, Lord, for them both to always continue to put their hope in you. For Vicki, Lord, for her eyesight, Lord, we lift her up and pray that you could uh, work and or would continue to work to bring healing unto her eyes. Lord, we lift them up into your, your, your hands as well. And Lord, all of Northwest Iowa today is grieving for the news, you know, the two teenagers who were killed in last week, Lord, down by Hinton, and our hearts ache for that family. And help us, Lord, to, uh, to pray for them. So there's a mom and a dad, Lord, who are grieving and hurting today. And only you can heal that hurt, Jesus. And we pray that you would come to do so for them. Lord, we lift them up. Lord, help us to be missionaries. Help us to be missionaries in our community. Lord, for this chili feed coming up. Lord, for the Cherish House. Lord, as many served at the banquet last, last week, help us to be missionaries. Uh, some of us might go across the seas. Most of us are going to go across the street. Help us to be missionaries here in Sheldon and, and 10 miles north, south, and east and west. Lord, thank you. Open up these doors and help us to jump through them, we ask. And thank you too, God. Thank you for uh, you know, those who are out on the roads, even now, plowing away snow, moving things, so that we can get out and about our regular business. For those who are working hard, Lord, and have done so and are continuing to do so, thank you. Thank you for our law enforcement, Lord. You know, they don't get a you know, snow day. If somebody's got to be out there helping. We thank you, God, for them as well. Bless them, Lord, we pray, and help us to give to them our support and encouragement. It's a tough job. Lord, we thank you that we can bring to you all of our prayers whether those that we you know, bring to you on a Sunday morning or we're laying in bed in the middle of the night or find ourselves, Lord, in the middle of a tough job at work or, Lord, we're just surprised by your great blessings, help us always to respond, Lord, with prayer and thanks and praise to you and where we need to intercession for the great needs that we face. We love you, Lord, and we bring our prayer to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you hear. We love you. In your great name we ask. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to continue uh, in worship with song, but also going to worship with our giving. And it, hey, today's a great advertisement, if you want to say it like that, for online giving. Of course, now you can give in the blue bags as they pass you by, but you know, say there was a day where we didn't have 
uh, worship because, well, it was just terrible outside. You know, if we have set up online electronic giving, we can continue to give whether there's you know, worship or not. And my family has done that. And it worked really, really well. But you can always give in the blue bags as they pass you by. And I encourage you to do that. If you want to get on your phone, you can do that with the instructions on the screen. Or click on the, the Give tab on the uh, website and follow the instructions there. But however we give, we're always building, giving to build God's kingdom. What? One life at a time. Let's sing. Let's give our gifts to the King too. And then sing with us, please. Please be seated. We don't have children in worship this morning, so kids, you get to hang out with me. But I'm going to need some help here in a little bit, so please pay attention. I'm going to need a little help. Uh, we're going to continue this uh, series that we began a few weeks ago on the promises of God. And there's one promise that God makes to all believers, and that is a promise to adopt us into God's family, to adopt us into his promise. That's the promise he makes. Now, here's the, here's the cool thing. There is a... Um, very close parallel that God makes in, in what we talk about adoption and what we think adoption is, or we experience as adoption. Now, some of us here have been adopted. You know, we didn't belong to the family we belong to now. We were born into another family, and for whatever reasons or purposes or ways, we've been adopted into this family. Some of us 
have also been on the receiving end. We have adopted uh, uh, children into our family. Those who were not our kids become our kids and become part of the family. And just like the ones who came by all natural methods, these belong to us in just the same way. I thought it might be a treat for us this morning to prepare our hearts for this idea of adoption, to watch one adoption. This ha- uh, is a couple who had been foster parents to these two boys. And they're pro- the oldest is probably around uh, 9, 10, probably maybe 10 or 11 years old. And, and the younger one, his little brother, is old, probably in the age of 6 or maybe 7 years old. And we get to watch here, uh, we get to watch in just a moment, the actual proceedings, about a minute and a half, the actual proceedings of the judge to declare them a part. I'm crying. <laughs> to declare them a part of their family. So, Kristen, would you change that slide? Let's watch. I think they all agree that this adoption ought to go forward. Yeah, they all agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all love them. Like, the whole family is, like, the best thing we ever have. Oh, boy. That's great. I'm glad to have these people. <laughs> That's really good to hear. Thousand uh, children in the United States that are in foster care, you know, as we said, roughly 400,000. 100,000 of those children are eligible for adoption across the United States. That is about six and two thirds of the population, uh, excuse me, six and two thirds times the population of O'Brien County. So think of Northwest Iowa and a little bit further than that. That's how many, you know, kids are across the nation are waiting for adoption. And that's, there's this close parallel between our experience of adoption and what God does for us, and we get the opportunity to explore that in greater depth uh, for us this morning. So would you please turn with me in your copy of the scriptures. Go to uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. There's some few key key texts uh, about this work that God does to bring us into his family, and Romans chapter 8 is one of those very key texts where it describes our being brought into God's family. Romans chapter 8. So all the way up from Romans chapter 7, we're hearing, uh, uh, through Romans chapter 7, we're hearing about the, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus that atones for our sin. He takes it all away. That righteousness from God doesn't come by things that we do, but it comes from God by trusting in his son Jesus. And Jesus paid the price that was ours to pay to make that a reality. When we come then to Romans chapter 8, we're beginning a transition. Now, how do we live as people of God. And, and uh, Romans, in that transition in Romans chapter 8, is this little part of teaching that God describes on uh, his adopting us into our family. Uh, this, your, um, your bulletin says uh, verse 12 we're going to start. Just for context, I want us to start at verse 9, and then we'll read through verse 17. We'll put our hearts and minds attention from verse 12 to 17. Okay, you, he's speaking, this is the Apostle Paul writing, the Holy Spirit's uh, dictating, okay, he's writing to the Romans, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, you also uh, that, uh, excuse me, and if the spirit of him living in you, he will, who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. 
Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it is not the sinful nature to live according to it, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brad, please pray us in. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank thee that we can come to worship you this morning. And Lord, we thank thee for the adoption which is ours through Christ Jesus, that you adopted us as brothers and sisters in faith through Christ Jesus alone. And Lord, we pray now that you'd pour your spirit upon Pastor Paul and on each one of us Mm -hmm. so that we may truly worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name alone we do pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Brad. So this is a curious thing that the Lord does when he adopts us into his family. I mean, that means we're kind of family. So turn to your, another, to your neighbor, maybe it's behind you, in, in front of you. Uh, turn to the other say, hey, brother, or hey, sister. Do whatever you want. Don't leave anybody out. Because if you're a Christian today and a follower of Jesus, filled with his spirit, Joel and Laura, don't forget uh, Daryl and Twyla behind you. Don't leave them out. It kind of makes us all family. Uh, isn't that great? We're all kind of family together. And, you know, in the end, in the end, when all things shall be made new and God, you know, brings the, you know, the full entry of his kingdom into the world, that's what it's going to be like, a great, great family reunion. And, and he makes us his family because we weren't his family because of the, you know, corruption of our lives coming into the world, and we all have it, okay? You're born into this world, you're born into the corruption, you know, prone to sin, and you do sin, which separates you from him all the more. We're outside of the family, but God makes us his and his alone. Let's look at the scriptures here. So as we come to verse 12, we have to realize right away that uh, the apostle Paul and the Spirit is speaking to the Roman Christians, okay? If you're a Christian, you're filled with God's Holy Spirit. You're filled with his Spirit, who lives in you. That spirit is the same spirit that's going to make you alive one day when Jesus returns at the resurrection. We talked about that a little bit when we spoke of the eternal life last week. But here's the thing. There's, there's sort of a, a chain of, of truth that we need to see here that brings us to our first greatest truth known. Okay? At verse 12, since we know, we know that the spirit lives in us, he comes to us at the time of our believing. All right? The, the Spirit comes to us and fills us at the time of our believing. And that could have been years ago for some of us. Maybe it was uh, a time you know, in Sunday school growing up. Maybe that was a time where I was watching a television show and my heart was moved. Or I had a good friend of mine tell me about Jesus and suddenly I believe, boom, that is the moment that God's Spirit indwells us. So in speaking to these Christians, when God's Spirit indwells you, there is a way to respond to that. Look at verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. That is, here's our response if God's Spirit dwells in us. Okay? Here's not the response. It is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. That's the corruption in which we come into the world. That's our normal and natural state. That's not what we should do. That's not the obligation. Because if you do that, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. That's what happens. And if you're, not, if you're living according to the sinful nature and just keep on doing that, maybe that's the, port, the note that says... Maybe you don't believe and have never received the Spirit. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. For if you live according to sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So here's the little first chain. He lives in us at the time of our believing. He comes to indwell us. Now, for the next step, okay, in that little last part, if, the spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Holy Spirit leads us to put to death the misdeeds of the body. Now, literally, this is literal put to death. All right? I mean, there's some times where we have to put, you know, maybe it's a loved and beloved you know, pet of ours, or we have an animal who's just injured, and we have to put them down. Sadly, that is exactly the words here. I know it brings up some sad emotions, because we... Love that you know, little puppy or that little cat or we had a special animal on the farm. But that's the same idea. But not something that we beloved, 
but put to death the misdeeds of our body, the sin that we do. Put it to death. I mean, li literally, hold it to the ground and put a bullet in its head of our sin. Not people, not anything else. Put it to death. But that's the literal picture here. But now look at the scriptures. It says, by the Spirit. That means not by your own effort and you're working, you know, working it through. It's by God working in you, putting this stuff to death. And this is a process that is not just a one-time thing, but it's an ongoing thing that happens for believers. Putting to death what is the misdeeds of our body. The process that the Lord works in that is the sanctification that God brings. Now, if that's happening in our lives, the next truth note is, uh, the, or the next little chain into this truth is, if he leads us okay, to do that, and we're defeating and putting to death sin in our lives, the truth is that then we become sons, uh, sons of God. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God, being led to put this, you know, misdeeds of the body to death, that means we're sons of God. And we'll talk about what that means sons of God in a little more depth, but we've kind of hit on that a little bit in the last few weeks as well. Now, and then this leads us to the biggest truth of all, because if you're, if you did not receive, verse 15, a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, we're not fearful of God, but you've received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, because we're led by the spirit of God. We receive the spirit that makes us a son. Okay? We are adopted into the family. That makes us a son. And the word Abba there, Abba means daddy. You don't just go around calling any old Joe Schmo daddy, do you? Now, now you know, Charlie, you know, he just became a dad, so I, you know, as pastor, I'll greet him and say, hey, dad, how you doing? You know, it's kind of a fun thing, but I won't continue to do that. You know, Mark and Melinda, I greeted them. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandpa. You know, just to celebrate with them. But I won't continue to. We don't do that. But if it's your dad, your father, and you're a little child, what do you say to your dad? Hudson, what do you call your dad? Dad? Do you ever call him daddy? No, okay. Does anybody call their dad daddy anymore? I used to. Okay, my daughter says that. That's true. All right. That's a term that implies close connection. And that God brings us into the family. So all of those chains, little nuggets together, leads us to this truth. In receiving the Holy Spirit, believers are adopted into God's family. You're adopted and brought in by the Spirit. You're brought in. You were once not a part of the family. Now you're a part of the family. You get to have a place you know, at the table at Thanksgiving. There's a chair for you at Christmas, so to speak. You belong. And this is what the Scriptures say. Here, let me give you a little more evidence from the Scriptures here. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, every, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be what? Adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of uh, and with his pleasure and will. Galatians has something similar. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We'll talk about what that means. For, you, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, you are, uh, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are part of the family. You know who I know who's part of the family who's not part of the family? Here's, here's one way I see it. There's a lot of different ways. If you're part of the family, you're there with, with, uh, when you're making plans for grandma's funeral or mom's funeral or dad's funeral. If you're part of the family, you're there because it's important part for everybody to be there. If you're part of the family, you definitely go to the hospital when the baby's born, right? Because you're family. Any old Joe Schmo can't just walk in off the street. They'll look at you funny. What in the world are you doing here? Because you're not a part of the family. But if you're a part of the family, there's a place for you. And friends, God makes us a part of his family. And he calls it. He gives us a title to that end. And that title is a son. Now remember, I've said this the last couple of weeks. The title son does not have anything to do with respect to God uh, with gender. Now, we say sons and daughters, and that designates, you know, boys and girls who belong to us. They're our children. But with respect to God, when we say you know, son of God, as the scriptures say, it's not 
something with respect to gender, but something of title and belonging and having a place at the table. So the first truth note that we need to recap in receiving the Holy Spirit, believers are adopted into God's family. But that does lead us to the question then, okay, what does it mean to be, what does it mean to be a son of, a son of God? Okay, this is the next scripture text, because we see here, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Okay, now I'm going to need somebody who's going to, uh, a boy or a girl, whoever can get up here first, I need some help. Who's going to help me out? I just said whoever's going to get up here first gets to help me. Whoever gets up here first gets to help me. Whoever gets here first, all right, Derek, you are my friend. You come to sit next to me at ball games and keep me company. That is so mm-hmm. awesome. Now, um, now, you're a great guy. I know that, right? I know. Have you guys ever met Derek? This is Derek Van Riggenborder. His mom and dad are Dan and Jennifer. They joined our church this past year. Really glad to have you. Okay. Um, so you're a really good friend. Are you my son? No. Yes. <laughs> no, I'll let your mom and dad keep you. <laughs> but it's true, you're not my son. Now, you're my friend, which is cool. You're my friend. Yeah. Uh, and you do, you do this thing where you sit next to people a lot and keep people company, don't you? You like doing that. Mm-hmm. And other people are blessed by it, too. It's a really nice thing. But you're not my son. Just to make that clear, who is, whose son are you? My mom and my dad. And where are they? Right there. Yeah, and you belong to your family mm-hmm. for good and forever. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. He's not my son because he doesn't belong to my family. Now, he can come over to my house, but I don't have a bedroom for you. Mm-hmm. Now, you come eat at my table and invite you over, but you know what? I'll have to make another spot because mm-hmm. mine are already taken up. Mm-hmm. You can come over as my friend. We can hang out together, mm-hmm. but you aren't my son. Mm-hmm. But you're your mom and dad's son. In the same way as we would give, you know, he's got the title son, he's a child of Dan and Jennifer. He's not mine. But God has made us all his sons and daughters as well. Okay, you go ahead, sit back down. Thanks, Derek. God has made us his sons by faith in Jesus. It's a title. And we give the, you know, a son or a daughter has a special place. They belong. You know, I, I like to think of it this way. I can walk into my mom and dad's house. I don't ring the doorbell. I don't knock on the door. I do honk long and hard before I drive onto the yard just to help the thing. Who's honking out there? I walk in the door. You can do that if you're a son and a daughter, right? You can do that. But you can't do that if you're anybody else. Now, occasionally, some of you are so kind to your pastor that you don't need to answer the door. I just sort of knock and open the door and say, Hello! You know, Margaret, it's me, Pastor Paul. Oh, come in. But that's a pretty special relationship. Most people aren't able to do that. A son, or in our case, when we say daughter, it's a, it's a place that designates where we belong. Son, with respect to God, is a title that says we belong to God's family. Now, we know this, because, you know, being a son of God isn't all used always with respect to people. It's a title that's not always used with respect to people. We can go to Psalm 82, verse 6, where the angels there are referred to as sons of God. You know, they have been given some respect of authority that God has delegated to them over certain places, and they aren't doing it well, and God's calling out on the carpet. And it says they're, you know, they're sons of God. It's not talking about people. It's talking about angels. And that's not the only reference in Scripture. But this title, sons, means that we're children of God, that we belong to the family. And this is what comes up in the scriptures. Adoption means that the believer is a son of God. We are you know, a child of God. You are a child of God by faith in, in receiving the Spirit in your life. Here's what the scriptures say. We just to vet it out a little more deeply. And yet, to all who have received him, first John, or John 1, verse 12, to all who received him, to those who have believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Not the privilege, but the right. It belongs to you. Because God said so. It's the right to become a child or children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or husband's will. You're not born by the natural methods, and we all know what's involved with that, but born of God, believing in Him. And this is where we get the phrase that Jesus develops a little later in the Gospel of John, being born again by faith, by trusting again. With the work of the Spirit, we become a child of God. Uh, in Ephesians, we hear it again in uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 3. Be imitators of God, therefore. Why? 
as dearly love children. Whose children? God's children. Because we're imitating him. And live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be any hint of sexual morality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Again, it goes back to what's being reiterated here in Romans 8 that as a child of God, there's a way to live in response to that. Okay? If you go into your family, in your family, there's a way to live, right? Don't you ever dare talk back to me. You know what I mean? That's one of the rules in our household. Don't do that. There's a way to live and a way to not live in response to being a son or a daughter or child of God. Uh, one more, First John verses uh, one, uh, 3, 1 through 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called, what? Children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know him is that it did not know him. And the, the does not know us is that we did not know him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God and what we ha- will be is not yet made known. So there's a fullness of this that is yet to come of what it means to be God's children, be a part of his family, to be a son of God, to have that title. It's irrespective of men or women is to be in the position a part of God's family. This is what God's had intended from the very beginning. He had his divine family with the angels, and God intended to create a human family that would become his own. And all who come to him by faith are part of that family. Now, it gets even better as we go through the scriptures and get a little more deep. If we go back now, verse 14, he says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Okay? For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. That is, a spirit that makes us fearful of God's acceptance. That's not it. Why? You've received the spirit of sonship, or as the scriptures sometimes get translated, spirit of adoption. Spirit of adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Then this next truth, verse 16. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That we are God's children. Now, there's a way, there's a way that we communicate to our own children that they belong to us. There's a way that we do that. You know, maybe, maybe it's with words that we speak, and we're just saying, I love you, okay, communicates that they belong to us. There's some outward expression of that, that they belong to us, you know, they know that. We provide for our children, and take care of them. We spend some quality time with them, we reassure them. And, and in the same ways, in the, or similar ways, God's Holy Spirit assures us that we are His children. There is, there is the inward speech that, that says, you belong, and this is God's Spirit just saying, you belong. You're part of the family. That reassures us of our faith in Christ, that we trust in Him, that tells us we belong. There's the inward speech, but then there's the outward demonstration that God's Spirit indwells within us, and that reassures us that, yeah, we are part of the body of Christ, the church. How, what, are, what is that outward demonstration? What's the fruit of the Spirit? Uh, here's what we read in... Uh, let me skip over this just a little bit. Here's what we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If the Spirit of God is indwelling us, there is fruit that comes from that. Just as apples produced, are produced from apple trees, that the Spirit produces within us certain types of fruit, behaviors, actions, that look like these things. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passage and desires, And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We know we belong if these things are seen in more abundant measure in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There was a time in my life where I was a very impatient person. Driver. There's even sometimes that it kind of works its way back in me. Very impatient driver. Okay. Does anybody else have that pet peeve like I do when somebody's not, you know, using their cruise control? Dave, you got that pet peeve? Just you know. Yeah. Okay. When I'm driving down Highway 20 or, or Interstate 80 and somebody's not using their cruise control, I can tell because they go fast, they go slow, they go fast, they go slow. Okay, you can see God's still got to work in my life with this patience kind of thing. 
But I'm way better than I used to be. But that's one of the ways that God shows us that we belong to the family because in increasing measure we see these things in our lives. Now some of these things, maybe we just kind of naturally do those. You know, um, being gentle. And some people are just naturally gentle. But some of us can be really, really harsh. And maybe we can look back on a part, time in our life where we have said some hard things, some tough things that we wish we wouldn't have said because as we look back, as God's Spirit looks, works in us, He's calling us to be more gentle. I, I saw somebody's Facebook post just, uh, I think it was this, even this morning or yesterday, um, somebody's Facebook post that said, there are a lot of things I used to say and spouted my opinions that were harsh and, were, and, and really hurt people. And you could see the Spirit of God working here and say, you know, that, that gentleness thing, that's something that needs to be worked on. And you could see that coming out, the gentleness and tenderness in her life. God's Spirit works in us. And so that the next truth is, um, oh, uh, God's Spirit works in us. And then we have this little follow-up from uh, can, the Canons of Dort from uh, uh, chapter 1, article 12. This is really good. The assurance of their eternal and unchangeable election to salvation is given to the chosen in due time. Okay, the assurance of our election. We belong to God. Is given to, in our chosen time. Through various stages and in different measures. Such assurance comes not by inquisitive searching into the hidden and deep things of God, but by noticing within themselves with spiritual joy, holy delight, the unmistakable fruits of election pointed out in God's word. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22-23. Such as true faith in Christ, which is another one, a childlike fear of God, a godly sorrow for their sins. You know someone's a believer when they hate their sin and are sorrowful for it. A hunger and thirst for righteousness, and so on. I like that, and so on. Like, well, what else is so on? Well, those are the things that we can notice in our lives. They're the outward things, in addition to what the Holy Spirit speaks to us and says, you belong, you belong. So the next truth note is this. The Holy Spirit assures the believer of his or her adoption as a child of God. But here's the great thing than this. And this is the last truth. Go to verse 17. This is it, and we'll wrap it up here pretty quick. Now, if we are children, okay, that is children of God, then we are heirs. What's an heir? An heir receives a blessing of an inheritance one day. We know that because many of our loved ones have gone on to be with the Lord and have died, and we've received an inheritance because we are heirs. Then we are heirs. Heirs of what? Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. What are we inheriting? It goes on to say, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that, this is the good part, that we may also share in his glory. We become heirs of God. Okay, remember uh, Ephesians chapter 1, all the spiritual blessings of Christ? That's part of the inheritance. What is the great inheritance that we all long for and all look for one day? I mean, this is what, this is what touches my heart. That one day when all the believers shall you know, rise from the dead and we're joined back together with all who've gone before us, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, moms and dads, children of ours, and we shall be reunited. That would be an awesome thing, right? Okay, thank you. I was hoping you would be excited about that. Yes, and that is our hope. That's part of the inheritance to be heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. So the truth then is this, having been adopted, being part of God's family, the believer is an heir of God and co-heir with Jesus. So the things that Jesus inherits are the things that we do too. Remember I always talk about, he's the truck and we're the trailer, we're hitched to him. So whatever Jesus experiences, we shall experience the same thing. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Yes. Shall we rise from the dead? Yes. If Jesus suffered, should we also expect to suffer? Yeah. He says in, what is it, John 16, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. But that's part of the inheritance. That's on the front end of the inheritance. On the back end of the inheritance, or what's later to come, is the glory. If we shall share in his sufferings, verse 17, in order that we may also share in his glory. The Apostle Paul had many sufferings. I mean, there was once that he was beaten within a you know, you know, hair of his life. There was once that he was shipwrecked and out at sea, floating amongst the debris. Uh, he was you know, been in prison and out of prison. There was a lot that he suffered for Jesus. Whippings, beatings, you know, 
Just regular stuff, you know, not too bad. He never did die until the very end. Boy, he suffered. And then there's our brothers and sisters today who suffer. They're being persecuted to this very day. Who suffer for Jesus. If they hated me, they'll hate you as well. Some of them have paid with their, with their lives. Some of them, their houses have been taken away. They've had to flee their villages, lost their jobs. I mean, that's just minimal stuff. Some husbands have been killed leaving a family behind to fend for themselves. And in some nations of the world, that's not a really great thing. Because you know, women don't have the opportunities in those nations that men do. And now they're left to take care of the whole family on their own. There's great suffering that comes. It's part of the inheritance. There's great suffering on the front end, but great glory on the back end. On that day when all things shall be made new. And what Jesus inherited, we also get to inherit from him as well. This is our hope. This is our hope. So let's put this word into practice in our lives. Let me give you a few things and then we'll wrap up our time together. What should we do? Have an honest little chat with yourself and with the Lord. Ask yourself, ask God. Just be honest. Do I belong to God's family? Do I belong? That's not a question. Do I belong to a church and have membership in a church? Or do I, do I come to worship? That's not the question. God doesn't promise you his adoption just because you came to church every Sunday of your life, or nearly all of them. He promises adoption by faith and then believing you receive the spirit that makes you a son, that makes you a child of God, that you belong to the family. Do, do you really belong today? Do you really belong? I can't answer that question for you, but I hope that you'll take some time between yourself and the Lord to have a little chat. Do I really belong? And this isn't a question that calls into question you know, your honest and integrity and faithfulness. Maybe you do belong and you find yourself, the Spirit saying, yeah, you do. And you, you look, you're asking yourself this question. You look back upon your life and you can see God's Spirit working in you, growing that patience, growing you in faithfulness, willing, you know, helping you to trust God more and more. You see God's Spirit working and you realize, you know what? I do belong. I do belong. So have an honest little chat with yourself. And ask yourself, do I belong? Do I belong? Here's the next thing. So you find out you do belong. And God's Spirit indwells with you. Put the, de- the misdeeds of the body to death by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot miss this in the Scriptures. Because it's here, it's been in several, several of the others that we have mentioned. We've got to put this to death. And that is one of the signs that we do belong. We see increasing measure of victory in our life over sin. What used to trap us, God by his spirit has untangled us from it and we've been set free. We should see that in an ever-increasing measure. I'm not saying we're perfect. That's not what we're saying because none of us will be until Christ comes in all of his fullness. But I am saying that the spirit works in us. We should be putting this death, you know, putting it to death. You know, we should put it to death. So do that. How do you do that? Here's a couple of things. Number one, we know in the scriptures that when we're tempted to sin, that God provides a way out, right? God provides a way out. There's an escape hatch, and we can get out when we need to. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit working in us, helps us to see that way out. We can be blinded by our anxiety and not see the way out, but God's Spirit helps us to see the way out. There's an escape hatch. We can get out. Ask the Spirit, help me to see that. But then, at the same time, pray. Pray for the Spirit's help to fight against these misdeeds of our bodies. And your temptation might not be your temptation, but it might be something else, but we all got something. Or maybe several something. And it's only by the power of the Spirit we put this to death. I mean, it, it, I mean it's like putting down a you know, rabid coyote or something. That's, that's the imagery. Put it to death. It's kind of a violent picture, but that's the image. Put it to death in our body. So put those down. Look for God's way out. Pray for the Holy Spirit to help you because we can't do it on our own. Can't do it on our own. Then lastly this. This is, this is a big one. I don't know if you've ever considered this in your life. You know, with over 100,000 children eligible for adoption in the United States. You know, the scriptures, Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, be imitators of God. Maybe you can Im- imitate God by adopting a child into your family. As you've been adopted into God's family, 
Maybe you can adopt a child into your family. Some of you might say, well, I'm long past that. Well, yeah, maybe. Maybe. That's all I'll say is maybe. God does work miracles, right? You might be saying, well, you don't have to adopt a baby. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm ready for a baby, to be honest with you. But maybe you could adopt. It, and if, it maybe, maybe, not, maybe not adoption. You're like, oh, that's a big step. What, what if you just said, I'm going to help some foster families, okay? And foster families who have kids in their home. They're not their permanent kids. They're just watching over them, helping them, helping them. Grow. Maybe you'll say, I'm going to help these families out. And when they need a little break, I'm going to you know, do what's necessary so that they can come into my house and I can take care of those kids for a few days, maybe a week at a time, and bless those foster families. Some of those foster families become adoptive families. Some of them don't. But maybe you could do that and play just a little piece of God's, uh, be a part of God's work in this world. Because if they come into your home, it's a perfect opportunity to pray for them, perfect opportunity to share truth with them, and maybe those seeds will one day come to fruition by which those children come to faith in Jesus. Maybe you could imitate God by bringing a child into your home. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. And Lord, help us not to be prideful of nothing of our own or nothing of ourselves that we belong to your family because it's all of you. And so let us be, respond with great thanksgiving, great praise, God, that you have made us your children by faith and upon believing your spirit moved upon us and filled us. Lord, work within us, we pray. That, that question, do we really belong? Do we really belong? Help us to see how we belong then, if we do belong. And if we don't belong, Lord, move upon our hearts that we might take the step to trust you, to become a part of your family. Some of us, Lord, today, uh, we, we, we're wondering to ourselves, um, how can I ever get free from some of this sin that's got me tangled up and tripping day after day? Holy Spirit, come and help us. And help us to see, Lord, you know, the uh, escape hatch, to see the way out that we don't have to give into it. But by your Spirit, help us to have power, Lord, to resist and, and to, give, to be obedient to you and how you call us to live as your people. And then, Lord, some of us today, maybe there's an opportunity to adopt or to, to, to bless some other families' lives and help. Well, Lord, might we imitate you in those things. We love you, Jesus. We lift our hearts to you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand.